opening hymn this morning is 286 wonderful words of life will you please stand for our opening hymn Only Savior, sanctify forever. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Heavenly Father, today we thank you for the wonderful words of life that you speak into our hearts today. We thank you for the promise of abundant life that you've given to us and eternal life as well. Lord, we ask that you come here into our presence as we lift our voices to you. We pray that our words may be acceptable in your sight, O Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Did you notice what color dress I'm wearing today? Black. I heard somebody say, I thought I was going to have to teach you your colors now. <clears throat> I am wearing black. And do you remember last month? I said, black is beautiful. Did you read the bulletin today? We're in the black. I got a note from Evelyn this week. She said, praise God and thanks to each and every one of you in the congregation that help us end our year in the black. I do so thank you. We have a great church here. We have people who are kind. We don't have a perfect church, but we have many people who are kind, loving, helpful, and we're all glad to be here. We have many programs. And all of that obviously needs support. So I'm very thankful that we did end the year in the black. It's always good to start out with a fresh, clean page. Let's bow our heads, please. <clears throat> Dear Lord, thank you very much for the Sabbath day. Thank you for being with us, caring about us, and wanting us to have eternal life. We love you, and we love what you have done for us. <clears throat> Amen.
Thank you, Linda, for that beautiful song. Uh, welcome, and happy Sabbath to everyone. They said it was sparse out here. It doesn't sound like it. <laughs> Sounds like everybody is, uh, is here, awake, uh, present, accounted for. Actually, we have, it sounds like, a lot of people down in uh, San Antonio at the General Conference, uh, which just kicked off here a couple days ago. Um, people getting settled in down there. And, in fact, I think our Peru Projects uh, uh, folks have a booth down there, so we might keep them in prayer uh, as we are uh, worshiping here today. A uh, few announcements. Uh, Charlene, do you want to go ahead and uh, tell us about VBS? Yeah, microphone. I suppose you can have that. So good morning. Um, we are now ready to start enrolling children in our Vacation Bible School. Um, two weeks from tomorrow will be our opening day. And I have the deacons who have some flyers. If anybody wants to um, do the flyer route of, re of enrolling their child, um, you can pick up flyers today, fill them out, turn them in at the end of the service, um, or bring them back next week. Or if you'd like, you can use the flyer as a reminder that you can go online and get them registered online. And you can go that route too. Um, if any parents want to bring their children or any grandparents are wanting to bring younger children, um, you're welcome to sign up and be part of our Vacation Bible School as well, and we will just put you in a tribe with your child, and um, it's a neat family way of being able to spend the week too. And I just want to remind you that any children that are under the age of five, we do ask that at least one parent or one adult come be with them and you don't just drop them off. Um, for those of you that have volunteered to be staff, I have sent out emails this last week with our two staff trainings. We're going to have this Tuesday at 6 o'clock and also Sunday at 1 o'clock. You don't have to be at both of them. It's an either or thing. Um, but I do, especially if you've never helped out with Vacation Bible School or if you're going to be doing a different job than you've done before, I strongly encourage to come to one of these training sessions. Um, because it's just really helpful in getting a feel of exactly what we're doing and what your role in that will be. And even if you've helped out before, we do have some changes in our procedures. And um, that can just, coming to the training session just makes it easier to keep you up to date on that. So Tuesday at 6 o'clock or Sunday at 1 o'clock. And then right after the Sunday 1 o'clock training, at 3 o'clock on Sunday afternoon, not tomorrow but the following week, we're going to do a work bee. So this is where we're going to get our costumes ready, where we're going to cut out stuff for crafts and um, different things like that. So if any of you want to be involved in helping, that's next Sunday, not tomorrow, but next Sunday at 3 o'clock. And then the following Sunday is when we start Vacation Bible School, and we need lots of helpers here at 9 o'clock that, uh, that Sunday morning um, to start setting up all of the equipment and all the decorations and everything that we need. So for those of you that are interested in the physical helping part, those are three things that are going on for that. Last week we had flyers to hand out for invitations and we had 150 flyers and I'm so thankful we gave them all away. Everyone wanted them. Um, we were going to have more for today. If you didn't get a chance to get yours and you want them, um, we were going to have more today but they um, got left at the printers. and. Um, so, um, if you're not going to be here next week or if you want them before next week, we are going to be picking them up as soon as the printers open. And um, we will have those so you can contact me, give you me your name and number, and I can make sure to um, arrange for a time to get them to you this week. Today after the service, there is an all-church uh, potluck picnic over at Holmes Lake Park, uh, about 70th and normal thereabouts. So... Uh, go ahead and bring some food on over. Uh, bring some, I don't know, some lawn games, some blankets, some guitars, whatever you want. Uh, enjoy some food and some fellowship. And then, uh, if you've got a bike, go ahead and bring that as well because I guess at about 3 o'clock, the Piedmont Peddlers are going to be uh, leaving on their, their afternoon bike ride from, uh, from Holmes Lake right there. So, and, and, of course, you get a... I hear you get a fancy decorations on your bike as well to celebrate 4th of July or something like that. So come on out. Uh, it'll be a lot of fun. Please join us in singing ancient words. They will be on the screen. And immediately following, we will sing, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. And at that time, if you will kneel, please.
Merciful God, we come to you in thanksgiving for our nation. We know that our many blessings of freedom, liberty, prosperity, and other gifts are too countless for us to list. They have come from your hand. Our nation and its many freedoms are a gift from you. And on this day, as we remember our nation's independence, we pause to honor you, to praise you, and thank you. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would forgive us of our sins, lead our church and our nation in a way we should go, and we would uh, include the general conference that is in session right now, that you would be with them, that your Holy Spirit would be with all the decisions that would be made. We want to uh, ask you that you would take, that let, let, you would let us not take things for granted, the gifts and the blessings that have come from you. May we always honor you. Be with us, Lord, as we strive to be a light and a beacon from you into the world. Help us to live our lives in a way that glorifies your name. Give us, Lord, the strength to be a blessing in someone else's life this week. And grant us the opportunity to lead others into your freedom and of the freedom that we have found in knowing you. Our Heavenly Father, be with our, our speaker this morning, be with Ryan, fill him with your Holy Spirit that what he says may come from you. Be with those that are sick and absent or discouraged today. We think of Tammy Adams, that you would uh, keep your healing hand upon her and all the others that might be discouraged or sick or hurt. So we leave us this service, dear Lord, into your hands. We pray for your blessings, for your Holy Spirit to be with us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. A reading from the uh, New King James Version, uh, James 4, 7, 8. Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will, he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, your sinners Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you, you double-minded. Let them in and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to, joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Amen. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. It is a uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, been a long while since I've I had the chance to to speak uh, to. Uh, Give, her a me give a message from God's Word. Been doing a lot of music lately. Um, 
So this is kind of, uh, I almost had to relearn how to do this. But that's okay. Uh, the title of my message today, if, if you see that, is called, I'm Humbler Than You Are. And I hope that you see the irony in that statement. We're going to be talking about pride versus humility this morning. Uh, we're going to be spending a little bit of time in Luke chapter 18. If you've got your Bibles with you, uh, please open them up. If you've got your, your tablets, your smartphones, go ahead and turn those on and get those opened to uh, uh, Luke chapter 18. You know, my wife says that uh, I pay better attention to her when I make eye contact. So let's, uh, let's, give the, let's give the Word of God some eye contact this morning, huh? And I know that there will be some of you out there who've got your smartphones in, uh, uh, in spite of what we might hope or think or confess. Uh, we'll be searching social media, Facebook and Twitter. And don't pretend like I don't know what, to, uh, what I'm talking about here. Uh, you know, in case you are, I f- you figure, hey, you might as well use it for something good. Uh, pay attention to the sermon. If you've got something that inspires you, go ahead and share uh, you know, tweet it, uh, just so we all kind of keep on the same topic. If you want to go ahead and use hashtags, I don't really use them, but if you want to, hashtag humble me. Uh, add me into the conversation. If, if you're not already friends with me on Facebook or if you're, we're not connected on Twitter, why not? Let's go ahead and uh, have a conversation on, on social media and, and discuss the sermon today. There we go. Let's see if this works now. Okay. So Luke chapter uh, 18, verses 9 uh, to 14, if you want to go ahead and and move there. Uh, Before we begin, let us have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we invite your spirit to be with us here this morning. We pray that all of the distractions may fade away and that we may be in tune to you and only you. Lord, I pray that that I will disappear, that the words that I, I speak will not be heard, but instead, Lord, that it will be your words who are heard here today. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Now, if someone were to ask me today, what is it that you believe is the greatest challenge the church faces? What is the most significant obstacle that the church faces in achieving its mission? You know, there's a lot of things we might say, a lot of things we might point to. I would like to suggest that perhaps the single greatest challenge that we face collectively as a body and as individual followers of Christ may very well be pride. What factor more than any other motivates so many people, young people in particular, to leave the church? Perhaps it is this issue, uh, at this, this issue at the root, which is pride. What is it that prevents our outreach and evangelistic efforts from being more successful? Perhaps it too is pride. And what is the primary cause of the various divisions and disputes within the church of God today? You know, to many of these things, we might suggest apathy, lack of spirituality, um, worldly, influencers, worldly influences, or any number of issues which may play some part in the matter, but at the heart of it, I believe our greatest enemy is this little five-letter letter word, pride. Pride has been at the center of the great controversy between good and evil since the very beginning. It is pride and self-interest that has been passed down on from the author of sin himself to each and every successive generation throughout Earth's history. And it is pride that threatens the spiritual well-being of Christians, you and me today, and the spiritual well-being of the body of Christ. In the time of Christ, pride was prevalent as well. It was something that he uh, readily addressed. We see throughout uh, his teaching, he continually was teaching his disciples to humble themselves. It is not about who is going to be the greatest, but indeed, who is to be the least. If you are going to follow me, you would make yourself a servant, Christ said. So uh, we are going to see one particular passage today where Jesus confronts this issue head on. He did not shy away from confronting pride. And you know, pride is one of those issues that it's, it's really hard to approach 
uh, mildly. You have to kind of hit it head on. And so Jesus was very direct, very blunt. In Luke chapter 18, beginning with verse 9, we see one of these, uh, one of these instances where Jesus confronted pride. And uh, Luke, as he introduces this story to us, he tells us that this parable, Jesus spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Certain members of his audience, now we're not going to name any names, but more than likely they were Pharisees. Uh, they had uh, this mentality uh, that they were better than everybody else. They held themselves in such high regard because they lived their lives so perfectly according to the letter of the law. And Luke notes that they trusted in themselves, or in other words, they had faith in themselves rather than in, in God where it should be. Um, because their faith was in themselves and not in God, they tended to look towards others who did not quite measure up to the same standard that they did, and they had a low opinion of these other people. And it wasn't just thoughts that crept into their mind. A lot of times these, these were outward expressions of spite and, and just outward um, uh, rejection of these other people who did not measure up to the standard that the Pharisees did. So Jesus presents a parable to the Pharisees, to the crowd as well, for their, for their growth, their personal uh, growth experience. And by way of comparison, he presents two men who have come to the temple to pray. One, a Pharisee, and the other, a tax collector. Now first, a little bit of history here. See, the sect of the Pharisees began about 120 years before the time of Christ. They arose out of a, uh, a movement whose objective it was to resist the influences of the secular world that had been steadily encroaching upon the Jewish people. Uh, this was during the time of the, the Greek empires and the Roman empires where these secular influences had, begin, uh, had begun to come in. And it was their mission to preserve the Torah, the law of God. It was also their mission to preserve Jewish religion, Jewish traditions, and to, uh, to separate themselves from the Greek and Roman influences that had uh, been encroaching upon their society. In fact, the very name Pharisees means separatists. This is who they were. They studied the law intensely, and as such, they were considered to be the primary experts in the field of the law. They were seen as the popular spiritual guides in Israel. And as such, they were the highest ideal of Jewish piety at that time. If you looked towards someone as an example to follow, it was the Pharisees. In contrast to the Pharisee, in Jesus' parable, we have a tax collector. The tax collector is at the very bottom of the Jewish so social system. Why is that? Um, well, they were very, very hated because like modern Americans, like historical Americans, living in Boston, pretty much like people in general, the Jews hated taxes. It all started back about the time shortly after Herod the Great died, 4 BC. Uh, his kingdom was divided amongst his three sons. Archelaus, who was his oldest son, was assigned the, the rule over the territories of Idumea, uh, Samaria, and Judea, which included, of course, Jerusalem. Now. The Jews didn't like Archelaus very much. In fact, they complained about him a lot, so much so that the emperor of Rome actually banished Archelaus to Rome. He said, hey, come on over here. Uh, you don't belong ruling those Jews anymore. So uh, instead, Rome set up procurators over, uh, over the Jews, which is basically administrative agents of Rome. Now, when this happened, uh, Caponius, who was the first Roman procurator, levied taxes against the Jews. In fact, it was a twofold tax. The first being a poll tax, meaning if you live here and you are on our census, you're going to pay taxes. And the Jews really did not like this because it was evidence to them that Rome saw them as slaves. You know, they thought they left slavery behind in Babylon. Well, now they're being taxed, and so they feel like, once again, they are slaves. And this was offensive to them. The second tax was a land tax. And this was especially offensive to them because... In their eyes, it was offensive to God. I mean, God is the true owner of the land. How can Rome tax something that is, for something that is not rightfully theirs? 
Uh, but in spite of the, uh, the frustration and the offense that the Jews had towards the taxes, many of them were convinced, hey, let's just comply with this taxation. We don't want any negative backlash uh, because of this. However, you always get that group of people together who say, no, this just isn't right. We're going to stand up against this. And so they did, and they, they uh, started a revolt against the Roman Empire. It was a very bloody, very violent revolt. Uh, Acts chapter 5, verse 37 actually makes reference to this revolt. But it was somewhat successful, I mean slightly successful, in that from this point forward, no, uh, Rome no longer made an attempt to tax the Jews directly. Instead, they began to employ tax collectors, publicans, to collect the taxes for them. And so these tax collectors, who were most often Jews themselves, collecting uh, taxes from other Jews on behalf of the hated Roman Empire, were among the most despised and hated of people. They were real scoundrels. In fact, a lot of them even lined their own pockets uh, just so they could get rich as well, collecting additional taxes. So here we see in Jesus' parable the vast distinction between these two worshipers that Jesus presents, one who is highly revered in society and one who is greatly despised. Now, were there, there were two times of prayer daily in, the, uh, in Israel, two times daily that the priests would offer incense on the golden altar, once in the morning and once in the evening. Now, if you were a faithful Jew, whether you lived in Jerusalem or whether you lived some, uh, you know, some long distance away, it would be part of your daily routine, morning and evening, to engage with the entire nation in this time of prayer. And for those who lived in or near Jerusalem, it was not uncommon for you actually to come to the temple uh, at this time. There were three separate courts surrounding the temple, as you may be able to see in the, uh, the picture here I've got. You've got the innermost court, which was the Israelites' court. This is where uh, the animal sacrifices, you actually come to make those animal sacrifices. Uh, the second court there you have is the women's court. This was as far as you could go if you were a Jewish woman. And then, of course, the, the outermost court was the court of the Gentiles there surrounding the temple. Because the Jews, the, the Gentiles were not actually permitted to enter into the temple. They could only go into this sort of designated courtyard area. But assuming that you were a Jew, uh, during these times of prayers, you might come to the temple, ascend the steps in, up and enter in through the main gate there, the beautiful gate, and into the court of women. And this is where the Jews would gather uh, during these times of prayers while the priests were offering the incense so that their prayers would be mingled with the incense and, and send up to God uh, that they might uh, receive the, the, the blessing of atonement made with God. Now, it was likely one of these times of prayer that Jesus has in mind as he paints this picture of two worshipers. The first one that he the highlights is the Pharisee. The Pharisee has come to the temple there today, uh, and as the scripture says, he stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men. I am not an extortioner, as he says. I'm not unjust. I'm not an adulterer. And especially, I'm not like this tax collector over here. And in addition, I fast twice a week, and I give tithes of everything that I possess. We can gather in this uh, an understanding of, of the Pharisee's motivation a little bit for coming to pray, pray that day, huh? He's not come there because he has an inner sense of his sinfulness. He's not come there seeking forgiveness, but instead he has come to worship because he's actually hoping to receive commendation from God. Maybe a little pat on the back. Hey, good job. How you, you know, how's it going? Keep it up. Uh, he's probably also seeking a little bit of commendation from his fellow Jews as well. His worship he regards as an act of merit that will recommend him to God, uh, according to uh, Christ's object lessons. At the same time, it will give the people a high opinion of his, pi his piety, and he hopes to secure favor with God and man. His worship is prompted by self-interest. God, I thank you that I am not like other men. Literally, what he is saying is, thank you that I am not like everyone else is. 
Uh, when writing this story, Luke might have chosen to use the word, uh, the Greek word eteros, meaning just generally, I'm not like other people, but instead he actually used the word lipos, meaning I'm not like everyone else. In a way, he is setting himself high above everyone else because there is something wrong with everybody else in the world, but not me. Jesus is addressing a prevailing issue, an attitude among Jews, perhaps specifically among Pharisees and those Pharisees who had been following him. There were those who had it in their minds that they were just a cut above everyone else. They were, they were cut from a different piece of stone than everybody else. They were more spiritual, more pious, more outwardly religious. And because of this, they actually believed, hey, I'm better. I'm better than you are. Even, even amongst their, their fellow Pharisees, I'm sure there was some of that. Because isn't that the, the way that pride works? It's not just enough to elevate one's own self, to extol one's own virtues. It goes beyond that. A heart that is filled with pride will actually find any means possible to cast a negative light on those around because the the worse you look the more righteous i appear i mean uh you know it sort of turns into this uh salvation this competition right there's not really room enough for all of us to make it so if i can just make it in above all of you well, i'm good sort of a survival of the fittest type attitude towards salvation we knock each other down a little bit uh because it makes us feel more secure in our salvation that way. So when the Pharisees come to the temple to pray, or when the Pharisee comes to the temple to pray, his attention is not focused on God as it should be. You know, you, you, a lot of times we, we picture, you know, eyes closed, you're, uh, you're bowing in reverence to God, but no, the Pharisee, he's standing, that, uh, standing up there, his eyes are sort of uh, bouncing around from each, each individual person looking at them and identifying the, the sins of the individual people, the sins that he himself does not commit. He makes note of how he is not like each and every one of them. And in the process, his eyes fall in condemnation upon the tax collector. And how ironic it is, he is uh, he's so convinced that the tax collector is a sinner because tax collectors are the, they're the most despised of all people. Outwardly, the tax collector is, is the worst sinner that anybody can think of. Yet in the heart of that tax collector, we see is everything that he needs to commend himself to God, to actually uh, achieve the desired righteousness that this Pharisee feels that he has earned by outward works. The tax collector has to come to the temple and standing afar off, as Luke says in chapter, uh, chapter 9, verse 13, standing afar off, uh, perhaps bowing in one of the corners of the temple all by himself, cowering there, uh, wanting not to be noticed. He pays no attention to who is around him. He's not, he's not surveying the crowd uh, to see who he can compare himself to like the Pharisee is doing. As far as he's concerned, there's nobody there but himself and God. There's no outward motivation. There's no concern for what other people are thinking. No, no concern for why the others have come there today. He has come to the temple with only one definite purpose in his mind. As David says, as the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. And his soul is longing for God, for the assurance of his love and forgiveness. He would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven and he beat his breast literally repeatedly beating his breast a picture that testifies to the sincerity of his words to the and give vivid expression to how unworthy he felt to even be in the temple how unworthy he felt to even be there in prayer to God he beats his chest repeatedly God be merciful to me a sinner God, be merciful to me. It's not just a prayer of uh, seeking pity. He's not seeking just God's sympathy or an emotional response. Uh, the, the words that he uses here, the language he uses, very rare language in the New Testament, actually only used one other time and seems to point actually specifically to sacrifice and to atonement. He's crying, God, make atonement for me. Pardon my sins. God, be merciful to me. The sinner. 
See, he prays this prayer as, there, as though there is no other sinner in the world. He is the only one. While the Pharisee has been looking around and elevating himself to a class of righteousness that only he exists in, the, the tax collector also has placed himself in a class of his own, far below everyone else. While the Pharisee thinks in his mind that he is righteous, that he is better than everyone else, the tax collector knows, I am a sinner. And in the hearing of a crowd of people which revered that Pharisee and despised the tax collector, Jesus declares, this man went down to his house justified, and the Pharisee did not. See, Jesus faced pride head on. He dealt with it heart, head on. He says, For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself shall be exalted. The idea of exaltation is a theme that we find throughout the New Testament. There are two primary ways in which this theme is used. First, in the exaltation of Christ himself. We see it in John chapter 3. Jesus, uh, Nicodemus comes to Jesus in the middle of the night, and what does Jesus say to him? He says, as Moses lifted up or exalted the serpent in the wilderness, so must I be lifted up in the wilderness, or I must be exalted. And we have a double meaning here, for Jesus is not simply speaking of his physical exaltation onto a wooden cross. He is pointing to that, yes. But he's also speaking of his spiritual exaltation before mankind and before all of the universe. And because of the great humility and sacrifice of Christ on behalf of sinful mankind, as Paul says in Philippians, God has also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every other name. So we find exaltation as a theme of the exaltation of Christ. But the second theme of exaltation we found throughout the New Testament is God's promise to those who are humble. That is, in due time, he'll lift you up. As James chapter 4, verse 10 says. Still trying to figure out how to multitask here, evidently. As, G as James says in, in chapter 4, verse 10, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. We see this throughout Jesus' ministry as well, as I stated earlier. Uh, example, for example, in Matthew chapter 18, verse 4, he said, Whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. His disciples were continually bickering over who is going to be the greatest in the kingdom. And Jesus would repeatedly come back to them with these expressions of, If you want to be great, you must humble yourself. If you want to be first, you must be last. And the flip side of this, of course, is those who exalt himself, uh, exalt themselves like the Pharisee did here in Jesus' parable. Those who exalt themselves instead of claiming the promise that one day in the future, God will exalt those who trust in him. God will put those people down. As Jesus said, many who are first will be last in Matthew chapter 19.30. See, the problem of pride versus humility is at the very heart of the conflict between good and evil. It was the issue at the heart of the fall of Lucifer in the beginning, who was already in an exalted position, a very exalted position, at the very throne of God. And yet he said in his heart, I want to be like the Most High. It's pride, and humil uh, pride versus humility that is at the heart of many of the issues that you and I face in our personal lives and in the church today. Pride may take on various forms. Sometimes it is obvious, like in, in the case of this, this parable with the Pharisee. Other times it is much more subtle, and it requires discernment in order to, to see it. But pride in whatever form, in whatever measure, always uh, seems to always take on similar character traits. Pride is... And pride is always, always detrimental to spiritual growth. As C.S. Lewis said, As long as you are proud, you cannot know God. A proud man 
A proud man is always looking down on things and people. And of course, as long as you are always looking down, you cannot see what is above you. A proud person does not simply build himself up. He does not simply uh, praise his, himself for the, the great attributes that he does. No, he has no a proud person looks at the others around him, highlighting those areas in which they do not measure up to himself. If we falsely make self the object of our faith, if we mistakenly look to our own merits as the assurance of our spiritual well-being, then it will only be natural for us to compare ourselves to others' selves. And not only do we compare ourselves to them, we might even magnify our own selves and then uh, magnify their faults because it makes us feel better about ourselves when we do that, much like the Pharisee did in Jesus' parable. We cast ourselves in a better light than we truly are. How often do we come to church and we we look at the other so-called Christians around us? You know, maybe... So-and-so's dress is just not quite what we feel is appropriate. How can somebody call themselves a Christian and come in here looking like that? And maybe, uh, maybe John, who's recently been baptized, you know, you saw him out back the other day. He thought nobody was looking, but I caught him smoking. Or, or maybe uh, Fred, whoever Fred may be. Fred, you know, he must not be converted after that all. I was scrolling through my Facebook feed and I saw pictures of him out at the bar drinking the other night. And we make these assumptions and these accusations. We have no idea the wrestling and the, the, uh, the spiritual battle that is going on in the minds and the hearts of other people. We have no idea the convictions that they are facing in their life. But we make the assumption that because their outward actions do not conform to ours, to the standard that we have set, that surely they must not truly be converted like we are. Maybe we, uh, we come to church and we find out who's preaching. Oh, man, Ryan's preaching today. I can't believe it. That, that guy, I can't, I can't stand the way he preaches. I just never get anything out of his message. You know, I could probably preach better than he does. <laughs> Maybe so. Uh, you know, I once even heard a, another, a member of another church express that they just did not have respect for the, the sermons that the head elder preached because he allows his children to watch those vampire shows and the Harry Potter movies. So I just don't even listen to what he says when he preaches. You know, and we miss out on a blessing that is there to be received from hearing the word of God preached because we harden our hearts and our minds against the people whose outward actions, their behavior, does not conform to the standard that we have set. Maybe it's not the preacher. Maybe it's the musicians. Maybe we don't like the music that is played or the instruments that are used. You know, if we were true Christians, we'd never let that kind of music into the church. Back in the 60s, we all knew that music was no good, and now suddenly it's okay? There's something wrong with that. As though... As though only... And I'm not going to say that, that all music is equally sacred... But I truly believe that God can bless us through all sorts of music, even if it's not perfect. God can bless us through music if we're willing. But we come and we listen to the music and we don't like whatever instruments are being used, the songs that are being sung, and we harden ourselves against the music, against the the message that is being presented. We may even sit in the back of the church and grumble and complain. So as as soon as this church service is over, I'm gonna certainly let them know that I did not appreciate that song. And we harden ourselves against the message. You know, it seems like, seems like I can't go a week without hearing about something that is, is leading to the shaking. You've heard of the shaking, right? Oh, this is going on over here. We're, we're getting ready for the shaking. You know, the Bible, uh, Ellen White talks about how there's going to be a shaking. And all the people are going to be, you know, half the people are going to be shaken out of the church. But of course, when we're talking about the shaking, we're certainly not going to be in the shaking ourselves, are we? It's everybody else that's going to be in the shaking. What if we didn't have a label or a category for everyone whose ideas do not align with our own? 
Maybe it's just, maybe it's reality. Maybe it's just our perception of their ideas. But we tend to label everyone who doesn't agree with us. You see, it seems like the easiest way to quote unquote win a theological discussion, an argument, and to convince others that, that I am right and they are wrong is to give my opponents a label. They're a fundamentalist. Uh, they're ultra-conservative. So-and-so is very liberal. Uh, that one project over there, they're just part of the emerging church movement. So you can't listen to a thing that they say regardless of what they're actually saying, because they're put into those labels, they are wrong. And often our approach to theology is very arrogant as well. We engage in personal studies. Maybe we formulate, formulate ideas. Occasionally we come across something new or different. Maybe we present these new ideas to others with the, with the hopes that, hey, we can come to some sort of agreement on this and maybe they'll, they'll bask in the wealth of my knowledge then we present those ideas only to find out that others don't quite agree with the ideas that we've presented. And then what is our conclusion? Well, obviously I'm right. And they must be hard-hearted and stiff-necked and, and closed-minded. So uh, obviously it's not going to do me any good. I'm not going to be able to convince them or the church the church is just set in its ways. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go out and I'm going to start my own independent ministry. There are a million different ways that we can point our fingers. We can go back and forth. We can discuss what's right and what's wrong with everyone and everything in the church to the point where we might even wonder, what is the point of being here anyway? Why should I even go to church in the first place? Everyone is just so fake. All other Christians are just so fake. The church is full of clicky gossipers who just talk about everybody behind their backs. And by the way, do you know what the pastor said the other week? I don't get anything out of church. Some of my best Sabbaths are when I get out into nature all by myself with no one else around. So I think I'm just going to give up on the whole church thing altogether. Friends, these attitudes are real. Every single one of them. I have heard every single one of these things expressed out of the mouth of one or more Christians, even Seventh-day Adventists. I will confess to you today that most of these attitudes are, are attitudes that have crept into my heart and my mind at one point or another. It may seem like I'm calling out a lot of people, and I'm going to be honest with you. I tried. I hope that something that I have said has touched your heart today. I hope you have recognized in yourself a little bit of the pride that you might experience. Because if we do not recognize the pride that is in our hearts, we cannot overcome that pride. If we cannot recognize pride for what it truly is, it will continue, it will remain. You know, there are moments when I have been tempted to view the church as empty, as shallow, as insignificant, or even as a burden. There have been moments when I have gone to church and felt uninspired and unmoved. There have been moments when I have been tempted to give up on the church for many of the above reasons, in addition to observed or perceived faults of the church, the members, the leaders, the organization. However, I've realized that this is a temptation and nothing more. Amen. It's not the moving of God's spirit on the heart. Amen. It is not the heart cry looking for something that is greater out there, it is really nothing more than pride, plain and simple. To say that there's nothing wrong with me and what is, go what is wrong is what is going on in the church. It's just pride. When we assume that the problem is an outside source, the church, the members, religion in general, whatever it may be, we are merely reassigning blame taking it from ourselves and placing it on someone else, and we are only contributing to a sinful superiority complex. If we come before God with a heart full of pride like the Pharisee did, there really is no blessing to be gained from being here. There's no reason to come and gather together. But when we come before him as the tax collector did, being fully aware of our sinfulness and being ready 
to confess and repent of that sin. We can truly understand what a tremendous privilege it is just to be here in God's presence. Heavenly Father, we pray that you will give us an understanding. Lord, may we not look upon others and think of them as less than ourselves. May we cast aside blame and pride and envy and strife. Lord, may we simply reflect on the fact that, Lord, we do not deserve to be here. Not a single one of us. We confess to you today, Lord, we are sinners. We are the chief of all sinners. Lord, we pray that you will make atonement for us, forgive us, and cleanse us. May we move forward in a spirit of unity, grace, and love together. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please join us for the closing hymn, number 648. Please stand. I vow to thee, my country. The first verse of this being about our country, and the second verse being about the country of heaven.
And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and to give you peace. Happy Sabbath. In Jesus' name, amen.